Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, that's a question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dino here, and before we begin I want to say thank you to my viewer German Furman for making this fun and seasonal art that I'll be using as my avatar for this video. If you'd like to send fan art and see it in a Dapper Dino video, I'm on Twitter as Dino underscore Dapper. Okay, but you're not here for that kind of housekeeping announcement. You're here because you want me to take apart some dumb stuff from the creationist internet. So let's do that. Biblical genealogies constrain the flood to just thousands of years ago and implies that at least one of the assumptions behind radiometric dating is invalid. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the f did you just say? It's basically nothing but challenges, since it disagrees with basically every external verifiable dating method ever devised. But hey, let's see where we go with this. The 14 different types of bioorganic materials, including blood vessels, collagen, and bone cells still found in dinosaur bones, also lends powerful support to the biblical timeline. Uh, no. <laughs> so here's Mary Schweitzer on that again. I don't think I need to add to it. It is interesting in the note that uh, the, the rates program that the Young Earth Creationist had, um, all of them actually agreed that the isometric, uh, excuse me, the isochron dating methods did indicate an, uh, an old Earth, um, and that the physics was correct, except that they were trying to find a way to say that decay constants had changed. But they, they did acknowledge that these dates are accurate within the framework of the science that we know to be the case, you know, as, as now. So I wanted to point that out that. He, that bugs me. Why would God try to trick us? That's a question I mean, we've asked them before. Why that's would really the meaning. It's like, okay, we're going to give you a brain and we're going to make a, a world of order because order is something God's known for. He's rational. He's consistent. So we're going to make this world of order and then, wow, we're going to trick you by saying that all the, the rules that you can figure out with your brain no longer apply. But I just I don't buy that. God's not the deceiver in this. And I think that young earth creationists have to be really, really careful when they sit there and try to manipulate the data to support their worldview. That is not science. Of course, that clip is from Steve McRae's channel. Link in the top right. Consistent with the biblical time frame, both asteroids and volcanism were concurrent with tsunami waves and crustal deformation induced by catastrophic plate tectonics, which was the ultimate driver of dinosaur extinction. Since radiometric dating can be cross-checked, since all of the assumptions are actually conclusions from other parts of science, and since the assumptions can actually be checked, it is radiometric dating which means that your literalist reading of the Bible cannot be correct. Physical reality is prior to the Bible, we test the Bible, or at least our interpretation of it, against reality. When they conflict, reality wins, and you can reject the Bible or change your interpretation. Let's look at a recent fossil bed that supports these conclusions. In 2019, the discovery of the Tanis fossil bed in North Dakota was announced, a discovery that many paleontologists are calling the find of the century. This two-acre fossil bed is a snapshot of what North America looked like at the peak of the Genesis flood. This site is full of fossils, many in upright rather than flat positions, including trees, plants, and saltwater mosasaurs mixed with thousands of complete freshwater paddlefish and sturgeons. Okay, the paper describing this is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, or PNAS for short. The paper is, A Seismically Induced Onshore Surge Deposit at the KPG Boundary, North Dakota, published April 23, 2019, by Robert A. De Palma et al. Although one of the people in the et al. is Walter Alvarez. You know, the one from the paper I mentioned earlier that was the one that first really proposed the asteroid hypothesis? This doesn't matter a whole lot, I just thought it was cool. Anyway, this paper doesn't mention Mosasaurus at all. Now, there is a mix of marine and freshwater organisms, and the paper claims that the marine organisms were washed into the freshwater area by an unusual blast caused by currents, and that the more marine organisms may have already been in a brackish rather than fully marine area. And let's not forget, at the end Cretaceous, the Hell Creek Formation, where this site is, was adjacent to the eastern coast of Laramidia, bordering the western side of the western interior seaway, so it's no surprise to see some mixing after a catastrophic event. I am not competent to assess the claim that this mixing was caused by marine organisms being moved into a normally freshwater environment, so I will leave it to the viewer to take a look at the paper. 
Also, the vertical position simply indicates the rapidity of the depositional event that caused the fossil bed. But that is not surprising, an asteroid impact isn't subtle or slow. The pristine condition of the fossils suggests that they were covered almost immediately after death. But the most amazing thing about this site is that the creatures here were buried with millions of microtectites, tiny blobs of glass that form when molten rock is blasted into the air by an asteroid impact and then fall back to Earth as smoking hot projectiles about the size of BBs. These were found jammed into the gills of about half of the fossilized fish, in amber, and buried into small mud dents around the site. Some believe these microtectites at this site are connected to the Chicxulub asteroid falling about 1,900 miles away. They also found broken remains from almost all known dinosaur categories in the area, including eggs and hatchlings, and a triceratops hip complete with tissue impressions, indicating a rapid death and burial. Even the evolutionary scientists admit this bone bed was caused by a flood. Specifically, two massive tsunamis they believe were initiated by Chicxulub impact 1,900 miles south. Yeah, that's right. That's what we'd expect to see in a coastal region after such an impact. But I do not. <clears throat> but I do want to point out that you have just admitted that mainstream geologists know a tsunami deposit or tsunamite when they see it. So why don't they agree with you that virtually all of the Mesozoic strata are tsunamite? Oh, because they're obviously not tsunamite. Got it. Biblical creationists, however, find evidence that leads to much broader flooding, mostly coming from rapidly subducting plates along the west coast of the continent. Except there is no such evidence, because if there were, then mainstream scientists would have noticed all the tsunamite throughout the Mesozoic strata, as you just admitted they are willing and able to do. Their research paper well established that this site was the result of at least two successive tsunamis, evidenced by the combination of land and marine creatures mixed together. No, that would be a mix of freshwater and marine organisms in a freshwater environment. Land organisms actually end up in marine sediments all the time, because they drown, get washed out to sea in a storm, etc. <clears throat> but it's far more rare for freshwater organisms to end up in saltwater deposits, and it's, and it's exceedingly rare for marine organisms to end up in a freshwater environment. The 3D condition of the fossils and the various age groups within each species, indicating a complete snapshot in time. The fossil fish also had clear signs of tetany, a condition indicating sudden death due to poisoning, asphyxiation, and choking. They're also clear that at least two major tsunamis occurred one right after the other, proven by rapid sedimentation and a 100-degree change in flow direction, indicating inundation and backflow phases. They also found no evidence of roots or burrows, nor of branches with attached leaves at the boundary between the tsunami layers. You mean the kind of thing even some creationists like Dr. Chadwick and Miss Weeks from Loma Linda University admit that we do find in other parts of the Mesozoic, indicating that these are not tsunamite deposits or turbidite deposits, like you would require? Got it. Another fossil site that supports the global flood as the explanation behind the dinosaur extinction is the Hanson Ranch bone bed in the lands formation of eastern Wyoming. This 80-acre dinosaur graveyard contains over a million bones, many of which are concentrated in a thin 1-2 to two meter layer of mudstone. One 500-meter square excavation area has yielded over 8,000 bones, most of which belong to hadrosaurs. Scientists believe they were killed by a catastrophic event, and their bones were later redeposited just weeks or months later, because the bones are in a graded bed with big bones at the bottom and little bones at the top a condition that requires sorting during a catastrophic emplacement. After these dinosaurs were killed by the initial event, their bodies floated, rotted, broke apart, and then just weeks or months later, massive amounts of water and mud picked up the collection of dead creatures and hydrologically sorted the bones, depositing them where they are today. This is accurate, but I hear a but coming. But here is the amazing thing. It's not just the Hanson Ranch that has tons of hadrosaur bones buried like this. Similar hadrosaur bone beds are all over America. In fact, when comparing the representation of the various types of bones found at this site to five other hadrosaur bone beds in Alaska, Montana, South Dakota, and Wyoming, scientists made an incredible finding. The types of bones found at these other locations were statistically significantly matched to the type of bones found at Hanson Ranch. This means that similar devastation and burial factors were in play at all six of these bone beds, evidenced by all sites having higher percentages of large limb and rib bones and low percentages of smaller bones, like vertebrae and chevrons. So what? Hadrosaurs were probably herd-dwelling, and they were extremely common, filling a similar niche to today's deer, who are also very numerous. Floods occur, 
and they can sweep up herds. Further, the similarity in flood-deposited graded bone beds in terms of which bones are preserved is to be expected even in somewhat dissimilar events, because the smaller a bone is, the more likely it is to be entirely swept away, crushed, or to have been carried off by a scavenger wholesale in the first place. The whole fossil record has a bias in favor of large bones. None of this even hints that these bone beds were formed simultaneously. Scientists believe these unique burial conditions were caused by an initial death event, followed by temporary emplacement where decay and disarticulation occurred. Then, hydraulic winnowing removed the connected sections, like vertebral columns and smaller bones, before the remaining bones were swept away by underwater debris flow that later resulted in the final deposit. Such a multi-phase, watery catastrophe doesn't line up with a single asteroid event, does it? No, but it's not supposed to, so again, no problem there. What happened here and at the other correlated sites was clearly the result of a worldwide flood. No, it was the result of flooding. We have a long way to go to overcome the evidence against a global flood before that even becomes a viable hypothesis. That flood deposits exist is not evidence that a global flood occurred, for the simple reason that we know floods occur and deposit sediment today. Therefore, they could have done so in the past. So it follows that there should be flood deposits in the geological record of Earth. There are. Now, if there were a global flood, there should be a vertically correlated worldwide group of flood deposits. No such deposits exist. Therefore, there is no evidence of a global flood. Further, a flood can only deposit by means of water, and this video assumes that at least all Mesozoic strata are the result of a global flood. But since there are aeolian, that is deposited by wind, and subaerial, that is laid down in open air, but not really carried by the wind, deposits in the Mesozoic, the Mesozoic strata cannot have all been formed by a single flood. Tsunamis from catastrophic rifting served the initial blow, killing these creatures and fracturing about 30% of their bones with green stick fractures that only occur with fresh bones. It needn't only be weeks old. Bone is the slowest part of an organism to decay besides the teeth. Further, these aren't tsunamite deposits. And finally, plenty of things like rocks and tree trunks can fracture bones in a normal everyday flood. There's something else that doesn't quite line up with the asteroid extinction theory. If the asteroid was responsible for the ultimate dinosaur wipeout, how did all the delicate creatures like mammals, frogs, birds, insects, fish, plants, and amphibians survive the same catastrophe? The dinosaurs and many marine reptiles were all mysteriously wiped out and fossilized while many other smaller and more environmentally sensitive animals lived? How could such an impact be powerful enough to wipe out all the tough, thick-skinned dinosaurs but leave behind the fragile, thin-skinned frogs and amphibians? The same goes for sensitive clams. Like a big scary flood? Sure. Okay, the next good while of this video is just repetitions of the same arguments and I'm skipping them. And we'll be finishing off this video next time. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, or hit dislike and tell me why you didn't. Also, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to say a special thank you to my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Jimmy Perry, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, and Henry Hutanen. All of their support helps make this channel possible, and if you'd like to join the team, links to both join the channel as well as the Patreon are down in the description. Tiers start as low as $1, and they get you access to the exclusive patron-only Discord server, as well as early access to almost all of my videos. However, if a monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there are links to my Teespring store, and of course, liking and sharing this video always helps. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur.